Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our another lecture in historical theology. This is our nineteenth. Let me get over there. Our nineteenth lecture, and tonight I will be covering Cyril of Alexandria. Uh, he's um, kind of one of the later guys. Um, very, very uh, important thinker here. Um, this will probably be my last lecture. Uh, for a while. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a round two. This was kind of supposed to be just kind of one segment of them. Uh, kind of really just the first four centuries is what I was kind of looking at. Though I've, I've talked about um, other other church fathers to come. So I got a lot more writing to do. I've written a lot of stuff much later. So I got a gap here I got to fill up. So we'll, we'll see. But uh, anyways, yeah, this has been a really good, good study here. So again, Cyril of Alexandria, um, born around 370. And he did not live to 4,044. That is a typo on my slide. I will fix that, but yeah, anyways, okay. All right, so so Cyril of Alexandria was a towering figure of his time. As the patriarch of Alexandria in 412, the tradition of leaders before him elevated the Alexandrian See, S-E-E, -E, to a position of great influence rivaled only by Rome, Constantinople, and Antioch. Cyril is most famous for his Christological works, formulating the, a doctrine of the hypostatic union grounded in Nicene theology that articulates two natures in Christ, a human and a divine, which are hypostatically united in the one person. His key writings were preserved in the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon, moving the church's theology of Christ forward against heretical notions most acutely in the influential writings of Nestorius, who was the bishop of Constantinople, who taught that the human person and the divine person were united in a manner, making them indistinguishable. However, Cyril's doctrine lacked precision as it pertains to person and nature, so the Council of Chalcedon 451 then modified it, making the distinction that affirmed Christ's two natures indivisibly united without confusion in the single subject of the person of Jesus, with both natures contributing to his enhancement and development. When reading Cyril's commentaries and treatises, one will quickly take note of his profound biblical and theological depth. His commentary on John, which will be the primary text of exposition, is a rigorous work articulated according to the economia or the skopos of the Bible. Now, if you recall skopos and economia, and there's two ways of looking at economia. But here, it has to do what is the scope? What is, what is being... Um, being revealed to us and that Christ is the center of all, the divine, the human, the one person of Jesus. So that's the scopos or the scope. Okay. Uh, Cyril's elucidations show a mastery of the text and a proper appropriation of theological and metaphysical terms as developed in the Nicene tradition. Because of his theologically tumultuous context, Cyril particularizes his arguments toward dispelling heretical assumptions and teachings, notably those advanced by the Arians, or we started a few lectures back, we heard of, of the Homoians. As mentioned, Cyril's commentary on John will be our primary text of study, with his well-known work on the unity of Christ and his not-so-well-known festal letters as supplemental literature for our study. While the focus of the study is to highlight the doctrine of God, Cyril's works are mostly Christological. However, his Christology stands on the theology of the great tradition. So, as we look at his Christological judgments, we will try to take notice of the Nicene scaffolding, if you will, throughout his writings. When I say scaffolding, the, the framework of his Christology is uh, scaffolded by a Nicene uh, con construct. Cyril's Christology follows the theological footprint of Athanasius. Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of the Father, the second person of the Trinity, as framed through a Nicene construct. When a believer is adopted and brought into fellowship with the triune God, Cyril insisted that in Jesus the believer encountered none other than the second person of the Trinity himself. The Christ, Cyril writes, the prophets of old declared his appearance to come, he sees this declared in the Psalms, in 43.3, which says, Send your light and your truth. Lord, part your heavens and come down. That's 144.4. And Christ came. 
Silas' Christology is supported by key passages, Hebrews 1.3, Philippians 2.7, and Acts 2.24, when he writes, quote, The only begotten word of God came to stay. Therefore he, who is the exact imprint of the Father's substance, who put on our likeness and, having become a human being, appeared on earth and lived among human beings, as one of the wise has said, end quote. The chief aim of Cyril's doctrine of Christ is to constantly bring to the fore that the Son is from the Father's substance. As the Word, the Father's only begotten, he is, like the Father, quote, passionless and immortal, end quote. Paul's letters to the Philippians, <coughs> excuse me, Paul's letter to the Philippians provides the basis of Cyril's high Christology due to the distinction set forth regarding the son's kenotic event. The word who was in the form of his father did not consider what he was. Rather, he considered us so that in taking on flesh, putting it to death, and rising from the grave, he might make us like him. However, his taking on flesh did not mean his form was no longer. Rather, it was because of his divine form as, quote, the one who possesses all power, end quote, that he was able to take on human form, conquer sin and death, thus, quote, being the basis of our salvation, end quote. Cyril writes, quote, he despoiled all of hell at once, opened the inescapable gates to the spirits of those asleep, left the devil there solitary and alone, and then rose on the third day, end quote. The word is, quote, called Jesus because he saves his people, end quote. He is called, quote, Christ because he was anointed for us, end quote. While the incarnation was the manifestation of the person of Christ, the word has always been with the Father, as Scripture says. He was the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. In the revealing of the word from the Father and the outpouring of the Spirit, Cyril tells us the simple message of the church. We have been baptized, that is, in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And by believing that the Holy Trinity is consubstantial, we worship one Godhead in it, thanking God the Father for having sent from heaven his own Son for the sake of our salvation. So the festal letters we observed were written with the lay person in mind. Cyril's commentary on John is a percipient piece of work. Though lucid, Cyril is relentless in his argumentation as he dismantles every lofty argument raised against the truth of the Son's fully shared essence with the Father. Now, we won't examine the entire commentary. We'll look at his exegesis of some key passages and the theological insights that, we, that he derives from them. So, in the beginning was the Word. Again, we'll look at John 1. What is the beginning, Cyril asks. He says, there is nothing older than the beginning as long as one does not violate the definition of beginning. Now, his obvious point is crucial for one to affirm if John's gospel is to make any metaphysical and theological sense at all. And in the beginning, John writes, was the word. We must assume that John has the beginning of time in mind. If the beginning has another beginning, then we will continue to into infinite regress. In fact, it is incomprehensible to think of what is before the beginning. Logic and reason restrict us to a beginning point. Therefore, we must contend that John's beginning implies the beginning, uh, beginning point of created reality. And at this beginning point, the Word was there. The Word did not come to be in the beginning, rather, the Word was. No matter how far back that beginning is, the Son will be found to have come to be, not in time, but rather to exist eternally with the Father. He exists before all ages. In fact, quote, his divine nature exempts him from having an end because he will always be the same, end quote. Cyril explains that the word's eternal relationship exists in his father as in a source, according to his own statement, I came from the father and have arrived. That's John 16, 28. Following the Nicene tradition, Cyril understands the words ad interrelations with the Father is, quote, because the word was his wisdom, power, imprint, radiance, and image, end quote. 
Following the Nicene tradition, Cyril understands the words, oh, I already said that. And because the word is these things, and the Father could never have been without them, then the Son must be eternal with the Father. Now, Cyril's precise to state that the Son is these things for the Father. Utilizing an analogy from Scripture, Cyril notes that we are to think of the Son as existing from the Father as water comes from a spring. While the common mistake is to see the Son as inferior because of this relation, one must understand that the Son exists in the substance of the Father. He radiates out from that substance like beams from the sun or heat from a fire. While it seems that beams and sun are different, or that water and source are different, both are inseparable. He writes, The one cannot exist in itself apart from the other, if the integrity of its own nature is truly preserved. End quote. Now, our creaturely minds struggle to grasp the importance of this necessary distinction. It is necessary because we believe in the one true God. And while we believe God is one God, we believe there are three divine persons or distinct modes within the one being of God. Now, you hear that modes, I'm not saying like modalism, um, I have to do with the divine, divine persons themselves exist in their mode of who they are in their hypostasis and their distinct being, but not separate as separating from the divine Godhead. Let's slide here. An important rule when it comes to retaining a consistent monotheistic Trinitarianism is what I call the five D's. It is distinctions don't divide nor diminish divinity. Di uh, distinctions don't divide nor diminish divinity. That is like the, the common error all throughout history, all throughout redemptive history, all throughout church history. I won't say, sorry, not redemptive, but church history. Um, that's where the heresies continually crop up is we start talking in di uh, um, distinction language. Somehow there's this thought that if we just make a distinction, that that one becomes inferior, or one becomes diminished, or one divides the persons, and now we have three gods, three beings, and that's not the case. Just remember that rule, the five Ds. The son's eternal relationship to the father, Sauer writes, will, quote, always be in the father and with him, and radiating from him according to the ineffable mode of divine generation, end quote. The father is the RK, or origin of the son and the spirit. Cyril says the Father is the beginningless beginning of the Son's nature, so to speak, but only in the sense of source because the Son's existence is from the Father. End quote. What are the entailments of this Christological understanding? The Son will possess the Father, the beginning or dominion that transcends all things. Next part of the passage. And the Word was with God. Now, in Cyril's book, he has these designated by chapters, so we're technically we're in chapter two. But so in this chapter, Cyril advances the discussion into the matter of the Father and the Son having an individuated existence termed hypostasis. The term denotes the word is a concretely existing individual. Cyril writes, sorry, Cyril writes, the Son is of the same substance as the Father. And the Father is of the same substance as the Son. Therefore, they ascend into an exact likeness, so that the Father is seen in the Son, and the Son is seen in the Father, and the one shines in the other. And that's his commentary on John 14, 9 through 10. Now, it may sound like Cyril is being redundant, or maybe even pedantic. However, too many have made doctrinal errors, so getting the divine grammar accurate is of, of the utmost importance. The Father and the Son, excuse me, each have their own subsistence. While they are the divine essence, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. Along with the Spirit, each one has their distinct identity or hypostasis in the Holy Trinity. If Cyril doesn't emphasize that there is a real distinction between the Father, Son, and Spirit, then the names have no meaning when it comes to reading and interpreting Scripture. What is the point, Cyril writes, of ordering believers 
to be baptized not into the unity, but into the Trinity? From Matthew 20, 19. That's a great question. I'm say it again. He writes, What is the point of ordering believers to be baptized not into the unity, but into the Trinity? Matthew 20, 19. So scripture reveals each one of those numbered is in his own hypostasis. But because there is no change in nature, each hypostasis ascends to one divine nature and receives the same worship. Chapter 3, And the Word Was God. A pivotal section in Cyril's exegesis we see before us. Here he merges all his arguments regarding the deity of the Son starting with the common ground, even among heretics, that the divine nature is one, the Trinity must completely possess identity of nature in the one being of God. Therefore, the Word was God. He did not come to be God later. John's use of the Word was, in attributing the divine nature to the Word, Cyril notes, implies his eternality because the one divine being is eternal, which Cyril writes is a strict consequence of being God. Now, Cyril proceeds to demonstrate that the Son's consubstantiality with the Father means complete equality with the Father. Following the classic pattern in patristic proofs for the deity of the Son, Cyril cites 1 Corinthians 1.24, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. He cites a handful of psalms establishing the integral unity of the Son to the Father in his divine actions, whereby the Son is, quote, light light and truth, Psalm 43.3, sent by the Father, the righteousness of the Father in giving life in Christ, Psalm 119.40, to those who believe in him, and the counsel of the Father to lead his people. It's from Psalm 73.24 and 33.11. The Son and Father inseparably act according to the one will of God. The divine acts demonstrate the divinity of the persons. Now again, Cyril has a theological axe to grind. With ardent opposition to Arius and his followers, Cyril asks, How can the Son, who is all things to the Father, be less than him? If so, then we would have to say that the Father is less than perfect, which is an impious assumption indeed. To conclude, Cyril writes, quote, Therefore, it is clear that the Son, the wisdom and power, the light and truth, the righteousness and counsel of the Father is also perfect. How could he, he who supplies perfection to his own Father be considered inferior? End quote. Excuse me. Man, my mouth. Cyril continues his argumentation nuancing a superior slash inferior distinction. He provides a litany of questions and answers to derive to drive home the point that it is madness to think that the scriptural testimony expresses that the Son is less than the Father. I will quote a few of them here in full, but take notice of the logical rigor in his argumentation. Cyril writes, If the Son is fullness, from John 1 16, how can anything inferior be in him? Opposing attributes cannot be in the same subject at the same time. And he says, if the Son, who is lesser, fills all things, where will the greatness of the Father go? And he says, I'm speaking in a corporeal way for the sake of example. Lesser and greater have different senses when applied to incorporeal objects. And then he says, if the divine nature is not subject to quantification, but whatever is inferior admits of degrees, how could the Son, who is God by nature, be considered inferior? And he says, if, as they say, he is inferior to the Father, he will be subject to quantification. Very, very keen insights here. In this last one, Cyril incorporates the Holy Spirit into his argument. But see how Cyril considers each of the persons in the one divine operation. Oh, I didn't include that one. Well, all right, I'll just have to go through it. He says, if the Son is inferior and the Father is superior, then they will clearly act differently in our sanctification in proportion to the measure that each one has. The Father will sanctify more, more, and the Son by himself will sanctify less. 
there will also be a twofold spirit who is inferior in the Son and superior in the Father. Those who are sanctified by the Father will be sanctified perfectly, and those who are sanctified by the Son will be sanctified imperfectly. But this line of reasoning is totally absurd. The Holy Spirit is one, and sanctification is one and perfect, supplied from the Father through the Son by nature. Therefore, the one who has the same activity as the perfect Father is not inferior to him. He has the spirit of the one who begat him, a good of his own nature, living the hypostatic, sorry, living in hypostatic, just as the Father has. I have a footnote here where I put Cyril here uses the word in hypostaton to describe the spirit. This does not mean the spirit is in hypostatic in the sense he exists only in the hypostasis of another and has no hypostasis of his own. That is how the term later becomes used to describe Christ's human nature. Here it means the spirit exists concretely as his own person. It's important to say because there are those that will say um, that Christ um, doesn't have his own hypostasis and therefore it, he, he gains it when he becomes the person of Jesus Christ. And that's not the case. <clears throat> All right, so Cyril continues his proofs for many pages. Some might say overkill, but heresy cannot be killed enough because it will rear its ugly head again and again. And those of you that know anything about this understand that these heresies continue to crop up. And today we have the Unitarians, we have Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so we have these types of those that make this terrible, terrible error and ultimately diminish the glory of Christ. Um, but we'll jump to chapter 5 in Cyril's commentary where he exposits John 1.3, which says, All things come to be through him, and without him not one thing came to be. So he begins noting the polytheistic errors of the Greeks, being devoted to the wisdom of the world. In others, he notes, pursued a more refined error, worshipping the creation instead of the creator. The theologian, which he refers to as the Apostle of John, must correct such idolatrous thinking and introduce the only begotten to us as the creator and craftsman by nature. The word as creator is the key identifying mark of the transcendent God. That's a very good point. I think if you're getting into modern debates with Jehovah's Witnesses, if you show the passages of Jesus as the creator, and we know that's the, the key identifying mark of the God of the Bible, and Jesus shares that, then there's no other conclusion than to say that Jesus is God. Damn, my mouth, sorry. Therefore, we have another argument demonstrating that the Son is equal to the Father. The Word as Creator puts Him above all creaturely reality because He is completely distinct from His generation. He is sui generis. And as creator, sorry, it's a Latin term, distinct of his own. There's only one kind. And he's a, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, sui generis would be, he is, gosh, I just lost my train of thought. He's just, he's distinct. There's only one kind. He's a, uh, what is that word? Well, those of you listening or watching, you'll figure it out. And as creator, the word, quote, by his ineffable power, brought all things into existence from non-existence, end quote. Now, again, it does not mean that God pulled something out of nothing. Rather, it's to say that everything that is came from God. He didn't happen upon um, created material and somehow started fashioning it to make something that he created where there was nothing that existed. He brought all things into existence. And I know that it is kind of maybe a little bit misleading, and there's definitely been some... Um, challenges to against creative ex nihilo because of the way these statements are framed, but it doesn't mean that he pulled something out of a nothing hat, if you will. That there was non-existence, and before there was non-existence, there was only God, and God himself brought all things into existence. The Son's power to create was not given to him, as the heretics would say. As the wisdom and power of God, he is the wisdom and power that proceeds by an altogether ineffable mode of generation from the Father. 
Reason being, Sywell writes, is so that the wisdom and power of the Father is understood to be the truly existing Son. And being the power and wisdom of God, all things that exist came to be through the Son. God creates through his wisdom in conceiving what to create, and God creates through his power in executing what he determines to create. Cyril ensures to maintain his creation doctrine within the confines of the Trinity. Here he writes, Of course the Father and the Holy Spirit also work with him and accompany him. The Son is completely in the Father on account of the immutability of his substance and the utter proximity and unmediated character of the Son's procession from him by nature. Now, Cyril provides an example from nature to help explain the Son's procession, writing, quote, it is as through sorry it is as though one were to say that the flower itself is with its fragrance by the operation of the sweet smell since the fragrance proceeds from the flower by nature isn't that cute <laughs> sorry so cyro comments on the lackluster effect this illustration has in that the divine nature surpasses this example so these ideas barely scratch the surface. Nevertheless, as with the patristic habits, such examples from creaturely reality, <coughs> excuse me, to explain the ineffable are helpful, though limited in manner and form. Now Cyril jumps ahead to John 5:17, which says, My father works until now, and I also work. It is a helpful move for Cyril to address this passage here. How are we to understand this passage if we claim the Son and the Father are one in creative work? Is the Father idle when the Son works? But that cannot be the case since the Son says, quote, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. That's in John 14, 10. Otherwise, Sarah writes, the Father would receive the ability not to have the Son always in himself, and the Son likewise would be seen not to have the Father always in himself. Cyro elaborates on the metaphysics of John 14.10. He writes, When we see the Son as imprint in the Father and the Father as archetype in the Son, we should certainly not understand that to indicate a mere similarity of substance. Rather, we hold that the Son shines forth begottenly from the Father's substance and that He is and subsists on His own in and from the substance as God the Word. Great statement. So his point is to emphasize the exactness of the Son to the Father and the inverse. They are distinct or separate by relation to each other, but in having the same nature, they are one another, are in one another, excuse me. And with this truth and the Holy Spirit who clearly comes from them, or comes with them, sorry, the number of the Holy Trinity arrives at one and the same divine nature. However, an objection follows. Can we have a proper sense of any of the persons if, quote, each one withdrew into complete individuality, and though separated in every respect from the shared nature of the other, and from any essential relationship, they were each called God? He raised this question because he anticipated the problem, and to answer, we do affirm the individuality of the persons, but we do not mix up the difference of persons or names with the position, position, excuse me, each one has. Say that again. We do affirm the individuality of the persons, but we do not mix up the difference of persons or names with the position each one has, end quote. And in doing so, we refer to the persons as the one divinity when it comes to their nature. Thus, in each having the same nature and each one is in the other, when each one works, they all work in one divine working. That's a succinct statement of the inseparability of operations. To solidify this point, Cyril brings us back to the Son as the wisdom from the Father's mind, noting that in the interpenetrating of the Son and the Father, there is no distance between them. Again, I didn't say interpreting. I said interpenetrating of the Son and the Father. We can also call those uh, perichoresis, which... Um, well, we don't even get to it now, but uh, anyways. So yeah, interpenetrating. Don't want to confuse uh, between them. Therefore, 
The mind can be seen in the word and wisdom, and the word in turn in the mind. That's a quote. This is profound for our understanding of the inseparability of the divine will and the actions, or and actions in the persons, so that we can say they are distinct as modes in the being of God, yet the one they are the one being of God. And I'll let Cyril here expound further. He says, And there is nothing intervening or separating one from the other. He is also power, since power resides without distance in those who are naturally capable of it. It cannot be separated from them the way an accident can, without the destruction of the subject. He is also the imprint, since an imprint is always naturally with and cannot be separated from the substance whose imprint it is. Therefore, since each one is in the other by nature and by necessity, it is clear that when the Father works, the Son will work, since He is His natural, essential, and hypostatic power. Likewise, when the Son works, the Father works as well, since He is the source of the creating Word, and He is by nature in His own offspring, just as the fire also is in the heat that proceeds from it. So in this interpenetration, which the Son and the Father have by nature, thus necessity, the Son is the glory of the Father, in that He is the agent of creation through whom all things came to be. And as the agent of creation, the wisdom and power of God, God the Father, is then glorified as creator because it is through the Son that he works all things and he brings into being things that are not. Cyril points out that in the decree of God to create mankind in our image and likeness, the Father does not command the Son to make mankind. Rather, the interpenetration of the Father and the Son means there is no distance between them, whereby the Son would be an instrument or derivative cause in creating. Rather, the Father shares his will for humanity in common with the Son, since the Son is in the Father by nature, as the imprinted word who is in him. So Cyril is careful to note that we shouldn't see the Father and the Son as individuated in bringing about creation, as if there were two gods, nor does one envelop, envelop, <laughs> nor does one, not envelope, nor does one envelop or contract in the other. That's hard for me to say, sorry. He writes, but we understand it in this way, as if one were to grant that light exists with the rays that admit that it, that it emits. So Cyril brings us back to a common analogy of Trinitarian expression. The Father and the Son are inseparably one in nature and essence, but nevertheless there is a distinction between them, like the Son and the rays, that must be retained. So concluding chapter 5, Cyril responds to those insane people, he says, who will claim that the Son is second rate or less than the Father in substance, equality, and likeness because scripture employs the prepositional phrase through whom when speaking of God's creative agency. We've already seen this in other articulations of how these prepositional phrases somehow make the son an instrument, but this that's not the case and this is what Cyril is going to work through as well. So he tends to various passages of scripture, 1 Corinthians 1:9, 2 Corinthians 1.1 1, 1 and Galatians 4.7, where we see the divine economy manifesting in redemptive activity, such as Paul being called to God in fellowship, apostleship, and sonship through the person of God the Father. Cyril critically asks, he says, Would we then impugn the very glory of the Father with the name and status of an underling just because the word through is applied to him also? No, such thinking is absurd. Therefore, we must be reminded of the fact that human language is weak when it comes to a precise explanation of the ineffable and God-befitting glory. And we must not let feeble words insufficient for the task of speaking of that which is incomprehensible demure our conception of any person of the Holy Trinity. Rather, we must concede supremacy to the divine and inexpressible nature over the power of language and the sharpness of every mind. In this way, we will be pious in no small degree. That's a quote. 
Now we're going to skip ahead to Cyril's exegesis of John 5, starting in verse 17. At this point in John's gospel, Jesus has healed a sick man on the Sabbath, which, reported, which was reported to the Jews and resulted in them coming to persecute Jesus. In response to them, Jesus says, My father is still working and I am working also. End quote. Therefore, the Jews sought to kill him because Jesus' statement implied that God was his own father, making himself equal to God. That's verse 18. You know, it is fascinating that Jews, though unable to perceive who the Son is, their response to his words provide one of the most precise statements in Scripture about Jesus' relationship to the Father. They understood that in Jesus calling God his own Father implied that he shared the same essence of the Father. All right, so like when I say I am Brian, son of John, there's an understanding that I share the humanness of my Father. And so the Jews understood that intimate connection as a derivative understanding that if Jesus says God is his Father, that he must share the essence of his Father. And then he kind of gives this um, paraphrase of what uh, he thinks that Jesus is trying to communicate. He says, It is as though he wants to say something like, If you believe, my friend, that God, who by his will and counsel crafted everything and set it in place, also rules creation even on the Sabbath day, so that the sun rises, rain-bearing fountains are likewise let loose, fruit springs up from the ground, not refusing to grow on account of the Sabbath, and fire performs its own <clears throat> excuse me, its own work, mis- ministering to human needs without being prevented, then know and admit with certainty the Father does what is God befitting even on the Sabbath. Why then, he says, do you ignorantly blame the one through whom he works all things? For God the Father will work in no other way than through his power and wisdom, the Son. That is why he says, I am also working. So Jesus' words are damning to them because they claim to honor the Father in keeping the Sabbath, but show they do not know him because they dishonor the Son. Jesus continues to speak about his works and that he can only do what he sees the Father doing. And by doing the same works as the Father, he demonstrates that he is from the Father, thus sharing the same identity of substance with him. If he only does what the Father does who is incomprehensible divinity by nature, then the Son likewise is incomprehensible divinity by nature because the things that have the same nature as each other will act in the same way. Nature follows nature. And Cyril teases this out further, noting that the Son's working all things after the Father in sustaining the world on the Sabbath, i.e. healing a man, is not because the Father taught him how to act. Rather, it is according to the laws of uncreated nature in that he ascends to the same will and action as God the Father. So I hope you see this here. Healing a man can only be done by what? By the work of God. So if the Jews attribute that to God the Father, and Jesus says he healed him, and he says, I am working as well, that means the same action... The one action of healing that man is done both by the Father and the Son, and then also the Spirit, though not mentioned. That is the case. So the three working inseparably to heal the man. In verse 19, Cyril logically concludes that the Son is of the same essence as the Father, because if the Son does whatever the Father does, how then is the Son inferior to the Father? To argue this point, his point from an earthly analogy, Cyril asks, could the offspring of fire have a different activity than fire without changing its activity? Good point. So then, the son's ability to do likewise implies he is of the same nature and power as God the Father. Cyril understands the difficulty in grasping the implications of this passage, so he examines it again under greater scrutiny so that we can understand according to godliness. He writes, Do you see how through the exact identity of their works, the Son shows himself to be like the Father in all things, so that he might be revealed through this to be the heir of his substance as well? Unquote. Cyril's exposition draws out the economia, the revealing of the triune nature and persons of God in creations through Jesus Christ. 
And because he is the Son made flesh, he speaks in language that attributes aspects proper to both natures. In the Son's expressing that he is not able to do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing, he is speaking of the divine nature, not in the human nature. He was, after all, really both in the same. But his saying that he is unable or cannot is not indicative of weakness in the Son. Rather, it denotes the capability of what is proper to one of the natures. Is healing proper to a human nature? No, it is not. It's only proper to the divine nature. The divine essence cannot eat grapes. It is, uh, it is unable to, just as the human essence cannot part the Red Sea, for it is unable to. Now, getting back to the context of the passage, the Jews persecuting him on the Sabbath, Cyril understands when Jesus says he only does what the Father does, he means to say that as the Father extends mercy on the Sabbath, since the Son is compassionate all the time as the Father is, then the Son like, no, likewise will extend mercy all the time. Thus the Son carries out the works of the Father in every way since he is from him. Before moving on to examine Cyril's Christology in more detail, I thought examining his interpretation of John 5.22 would prove quite instructive, not just for understanding Cyril, but as an exegetical tool in our theological interpretation. Excuse me, we're talking about the skapos, the economia, and the economy, and the theologia. So, in John 5.22, Jesus says, The Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Now, heretics will cite this passage as a key proof text to demonstrate that the Son is not truly God by nature. Now, Cyril interprets this passage according to the economy, whereby the Father is given the authority to judge to the Son according to his human nature. Jesus, according to his human nature, must play by the rules, if you will. Thus, we can only attribute what is proper to humanity, even though it is Jesus Christ. Therefore, while the Word has all the fullness of the divine nature, thus has all things that belong to the Father, the Word made flesh receives what he has from God, as is proper to his humanity. Cyril cites 1 Corinthians 4, 7, which says, What do you have that you did not receive? And so the Son confesses that it was fitting for him to receive that authority. Next, Niro takes... Niro. <laughs> Next, Cyril takes up the position of his opponents who will look at this passage and say, See, the Son explicitly says that he has received judgment from the Father. Clearly, one who receives does not have. How then could the one who gives with the authority, with authority, is not greater of a superior nature than the one who must receive? But Cyril is not intimidated one bit. Why is that? Because the argument is unskillfully constructed, he says, in that it perf perfectly, perfectly fits the oikonomia with the flesh when he was called a slave and when he humbled himself, being made in our likeness. Ooh, where's my tissue paper? Oh, I don't have it. Sorry. Nose is running a little bit. Hold on a second. Now, Cyril's response is superb, and I quote him in full, and it's very, very long. All right. So. First, now this is Cyril speaking. First, let us say, <coughs> the one who is said to give something does not necessarily or in every case grant it to someone who receives because they do not have, nor is the giver always greater than the receiver. Otherwise, what will you do when you see the holy psalmist saying in the spirit, give glory to God? From Psalm 57, 75, 7, shall we think then that God stands in need of glory or that, or that he who we who are commanded to offer it to him are greater than the creator because of this? But not even you who do not shrink from blasphemy will dare to say this since the divine nature is full of glory, even though it does not receive it from us. That which has something inherently and receives it as an honor could never be considered inferior to those who offer glory to it as a gift. Excuse me. I have a little note here. Oh, FaceTime quit. I should, okay, I'm still recording. All right, we're good. One may, 
One may then see that very often the one who has received something is not inferior to the giver, and the father is not a superior nature to his own offspring just because he has given all judgment to him. Next slide. Oh. Judging is an activity and nothing else. What then has the father given the son? He does not give something additional as from his own nature when he entrusts all judgment to him, but rather he gives him an activity over against those who are judged. How then will he be greater because of this or be of a superior nature because he added something that was not in the Son, since the Son says, Everything that the Father has is mine. John 16, 15. So, listen to how giving must then be understood. Just as God the Father has the ability to create and creates all things through the Son as through his own power and strength, so also he has the power to judge, and he will exercise that power through the Son as through his own righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Last slide. Just as though fire were said to supply a certain burning to the activity that is from it by nature, so also if we reverently interpret he has given along the same lines, we will escape the snare of the devil. But if they shamelessly persist in asserting that glory is added to him from the Father because of his appearing as judge of the earth, let them teach us how he could still be considered the Lord of glory if he is crowned with glory in the end times. Oh, that was a stretch on my jaw. So Cyril's interpretation is consistent in that he doesn't stray from the economia. Heretics stray from the skopos, right, the, the scope of Scripture, the governing rule of scriptural interpretation that Christ is fully human and fully divine. And they stray from it because it is a revealed rule. It is only through divine revelation that we can receive the glorious truth that the incomprehensible God took on flesh. And applying that revealed truth, Revealed rule ensures our interpretation aligns with the meaning the divine author intended for his people to know. Now, there is much more to examine in Cyril's writings, but in the review, brief review thus far, we notice in Cyril a tenacious consistency in maintaining the unity of the Father and the Son, <clears throat> whereby he operates within his interpretive parameters with the understanding that the distinction between the Father and the Son is only by relation, not essence. In doing so, Cyril's interpretive conclusions satisfy the demands of the text in their intention to communicate two equal truths that if not read with a rigid dichotomy, as in maintaining proper predications according to natures, will distort the meaning altogether, leading one to mythology or just utter incoherency. Okay, now we're breaking away from that text and we're going to be taking up a work called On the Unity of Christ. <clears throat> now, this treatise is a dialogue whereby Cyril, with theological and philosophical rigor, develops his hypostatic union doctrine. Now, his main opponent he is challenging is Nestorius, the bishop of Constantinople around 345, who entered the spotlight for his rejection of the term theotokos, which is God-bearer for the Virgin Mary. He rejected it because he thought no human woman could bear the eternal God. That debate will not be examined here, but it has relevance for his doctrine of Christ in that as he could not affirm a human being could bear the eternal God, the incarnation likewise could not be a true union of divinity and humanity. Nestorius saw that God and man were radically different. Jesus was truly human, experiencing all that which, all that which pertains to humanity. But in the incarnation, the fully divine Logos was in communion with the holy life of Jesus, but was not in any way dominated nor subjected by it. Nestorius thought that divinity and humanity can only be maintained if the two remain two. Cyril thought Nestorian's doctrine of the incarnation was abhorrent. For Cyril, the redemptive aim was not about God and man merely having a relationship, Rather, it was about full reconciliation of God and man in Jesus. As such, the divine act of reconciliation is a work intended to transform humanity from a mortal fallen creature to an immortal, divinized spiritual creature. Therefore, 
The incarnation had to be a seamless union. This process was the drawing in of humanity into the life of God termed theosis or deification. Far from a pagan conception of this process, theosis was the ineffable act of grace whereby the second person of the Trinity becomes man so that we might become like God. Cyro slogans this redemptive act, quote, What he was by nature, we become by grace, end quote. The incarnation is the unfathomable demonstration of God's infinite power, making the invisible Lord visible, in that the eternal God, who cannot be contained, contains himself in human flesh, living among his people and ultimately going to the cross for them. The challenge the church and Cyril faced was the manner of articulating a cogent doctrine of the incarnation that was completely distinguishable from a paganized concept of divinity. As mentioned, this divine act was inexplicable. Nevertheless, it was the event of all events in human history, and Scripture's revelation of this event presses the human intellect to its limits. Now, the impetus driving Cyril's investigation was understanding the subjective unity of Christ. If he followed Nestorius, then the incarnational scheme posited two sons existing side by side. But Cyril could not accept such perversion. And this work is his attempt at solving the dilemma in a logical manner that is faithful to biblical revelation, ensuring to avoid any hints of corrupting the gospel. Again, the work we're talking about is on the unity of Christ. Water break. So his task is to develop a doctrine that accounts for the humanity and deity of Christ, a true union of humanity and divinity that is by no means mixed or overlapped or cohabited or of mere association. Rather, as we will see, Cyril terms his doctrine a hypostatic union, whereby, to quote Mr. John McGuckin, Mig, McGuckin, who is a Cyril scholar, he writes, this, this is the summation of this doctrine. He says, the person of the Logos is the sole personal subject of all the conditions of his existence, divine or human. The Logos is, needless to say, the sole personal subject of all his own acts as eternal Lord, the creation, the inspiration of the prophets, and so on. But after the incarnation, the same one is also the personal subject directing all his actions performed within this time and this space, in, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> embodied acts which form the context of the human life of Christ in Palestine. Cyril's hypostatic doctrine was a mia physis, a singularity of the existence of Jesus and not a blurring of the quiddities, which is a Latin phrase for the whatness of divinity and humanity. So again, it's a singularity of the existence of Jesus, not a blurring of the whatness, not a blurring of the divinity and the humanity of him. Flip the page. The most egregious error would be to propose a doctrine that posits Christ as a tertium quid, another Latin phrase, which means a third thing, almost kind of like a mutant. Like if you watch Marvel comics, or sorry, Marvel movies, those are all tertium quids. Anyways, so Cyril begins his treatise in dialogue form, getting familiar with Nestorius' aberrant views, which stray from orthodoxy. Immediately, he inquires about his rejection of Mary as the Theotokos, noting it, as, noting it is because he maintains she has not given birth to God since the word was before her, in fact before every age, thus he is co-eternal, quote, ineffably begotten by nature from God the Father. Cyril shifts his argumentation towards they, which seems to refer to a band of Nestorian followers. In their understanding of the word becoming flesh, John 1.14, the words becoming human meant he ceased to be what he was before. Taking on flesh signified a change in the word. But Cyril is put off by their erroneous assumptions, noting scriptural passages that speak of the Lord as a refuge, Psalm 90 verse 1 and 94.22. By no means imply he does so by transformation of his nature into something else. God by nature is immutable. He remains that which he was and is forever, regardless of his becoming a refuge for us. Cyril will not budge from his, from his formative doctrine of God. He must provide an account of the incarnation that preserves the immutability and inalterability as innate and essential to God. 
Therefore, the incarnation was, a, was not a change, a mixing or blending of the only begotten word into, with, into or with human form. Rather, Cyril says it was an act of submission, as Hebrews 12.2 reveals. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising shame. One of the most insightful remarks I have heard that properly places the Son's submission in the divine essence is from the late John Webster. And he writes, The Son's submission is a mode of his perfection, not a lack in it. I love that. It's so helpful because one of the biggest discussions, especially if we're uh, getting involved in the EFS debate, the eternal functional subordination of the Son, uh, this idea of submission somehow makes it to where there's this functional subordination. And I think John, John Webster's fra- uh, statement here really kind of, kind of quells that by saying that his submission is a mode of perfection, not a lack in it. So the submission of the Son, right, is another mode, not distinct like modalism, okay, but that manifests a perfection of God. Like love is a perfection, submission in God, rightful submission is a perfection in God, not a lack of something. So very, very precise, very keen. Uh, Keep that one. Uh, It's really good. Therefore, as God, Cyril writes, he wished to make that flesh, which was held in the grip of sin and death, evidently superior to sin and death. He made it it his very own, and not soulless, as some have said, but rather animated with a rational soul, and thus he restored flesh to what it was in the beginning. The incomprehensible and and ineffable act, Cyril writes, was for the economy of salvation. In one single act of generation, the Son is begotten from God the Father, which is then revealed to us in the divine economy. Drawing from 2 Corinthians 8 9, Cyril succinctly states, He took what was ours to be his very own, so that we might have all that was his. Very good, clear statement. But his opponents have turned the mystery of the economy in the flesh completely on its head. Cyril addresses his opponents who have strayed from the scoffots of scripture, interpreting passages that seem to indicate Christ is not true God of God as the Father. Masterfully, Cyril interprets scripture with the Theologia Economia lens, which maintains the unity of the God-man, whereby the person of the Lord is sole subject, experiencing and acting in what is proper to his humanity and also his divinity. When he refers to Christ as the sole subject, Cyril is claiming that 1. Jesus is a real existent being, a meophysis, and 2. He is the one Logos existing as incarnate, 2. Lagu Cesarcomene. So this is from a, a book I'm working on, so I probably could left that out. Anyways, Um, All that we see in scripture about Christ, that which speaks of the eternity as God, and that which speaks of his human birth, pertains to one and the same, as befitting for him as God, and befitting him as man. Therefore, Cyril's interpretation of Christological passages glides along the spectrum of the Theologia Economia framework, so that he doesn't deny key teachings found elsewhere in scripture. So, how does he do this? Well, Let's observe how Cyril handles a few passages. In Matthew 23, 9, Jesus says, Do not call anyone on earth your father, because you have one father who is in heaven. Cyril writes, And because he came down into our condition solely in order to lead us to his own divine state, he also said, quote, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. That's from John 20, 17. <laughs> And Sauer writes, In this case, the Heavenly One is his natural Father. In our case, he is our God. But insofar as this true and natural Son became as we are, so he speaks of the Father as his God, a language fitting to his self-emptying. So that's why he says that this is my God, because a human must speak properly to humanity. And so for him to say that it is my God is completely theologically correct. Well, it's also, also um, theologically correct for him to say he's my father. And Cyril writes, oh, I already said that. Uh, Cyril avoids the interpretive mistakes his opponents, the Nestorians, make in that they swerve to the divine side of Christ or the human side, giving it the, the dominant controlling power in their interpretations. Now, while there is a non-contrastive dichotomy between the natures, there is an 
there is an undissolvable dissolvable unity in the person, subject, of the Lord Christ. When it comes to these types of conflicting passages, Cyril interprets them in a manner befitting of the context. So in Matthew 23, 9, Cyril delineates the economic entailments in that because no one is to call a man your father, since there is only one true father in heaven, he, the son, came down to us to bring us to his own divine state. As the God-man, he is the true form of perfected humanity his, who is fully obedient to the father as the last Adam. And thus, as the perfect human, he will not call a man on earth his father, but as the God-man, he comes down from heaven so that he can bring us to the true Father in heaven. Therefore, in referencing John twenty seventeen, in what Jesus tells Mary that he is in that Jesus tells Mary he is going to his father and to your father, Jesus is speaking of the heavenly one as his father, befitting of his natural generation as the begotten son from the father. But to us, the Father is our God. In, in becoming as we are in human weakness, he speaks of the Father as his God in self-emptying language befitting of his humanity. This last point is crucial. For Christ to fulfill the law and redeem humanity, he must live as man in every way as man in complete creaturely submission to God. And on the cross, the fragility of Jesus his flesh becomes the medium of translucency to the glory of God. The crucified Son simply is the glory of God. That's from Aaron Riches. A great statement. I'm saying it again. And on the cross, the fragility of Jesus' flesh becomes the medium of translucency to the glory of God. The crucified Son simply is the glory of God. Now, when we consider the unity of Christ, we have an ontological unity which maintains both natures unitedly. Between the two natures is a communicatio idiomatum, which is the communication of properties in the one person. So this entails a threefold axiom. One, it is truly God, the Son who is man. Two, it is truly man that the Son of God is. And three, the Son of God <coughs> truly is man. In these axioms, the Lord Jesus is truly and fully divine, truly and fully human, human, and there is ontological unity between the person of the Son and his humanity. In this synergistic union, the human nature of Jesus does not have its own hypostasis apart from the one Lord. So while the, while the Lord, the, the, the Logos, has his own hypostasis, the, the, human, the human nature of Jesus does not. That does not exist somewhere where he kind of where the, the, the Logos takes it, that would be adoption. No, basically the the um, hypostasis of the human nature of Jesus basically takes shape in the incarnation. It comes to being in the incarnation. So the Son is the singular existence of the human Jesus. In the hypostatic union, the human nature acquires existence in the existence of God in the mode of being of the Word. Articulation of the doctrine in this manner guarded against the idea of a double existence of Christ as the Logos and as man. Now, the Incarnation has no creaturely analog. Thus, in the hypostatic union, what Christ achieves in the new integrity of human nature, discovered in his theandric energy, is a crucial inversion. Divine things are done humanly, and human things are done divinely. If he conquered as God, to us it is nothing. But if he conquered as man, we conquered in him. Well, that wraps up our lecture of Cyril of Alexandria. These here are the books that um, I utilized for study. I think there was a few others I did not put in there. I remember them now. Uh, but these are great works to go to. And like I said, this is probably going to wrap up my lectures for this segment, uh, the next block. Not sure when that would be or I would start. Um, I, I, you know, I might have a few more. I kept thinking I did a few more um, expositional treatises on, I think, John Damascene. I started on um, uh, Maximus the Confessor, about to say, his stuff is weird. I'm going to try. I, I struggled so much trying to really go through that in a cogent manner, but I'll give it a shot. So anyways, again, I hope this lecture and all the lectures up to this point have been very helpful to see the great tradition of our understanding of the doctrine of God. And um, yeah, please share these with people because we need to have right doctrine. We need to have right orthodoxy to be able to combat 
the her the um, heresies that continue to crop up throughout uh, church history. So, again, thank you very much. I hope, again, these were helpful. Uh, take care, and I will see you maybe some other time.